Let's look at the supply chain and how we can derive some benefits from the process as we close out this chapter. The forecast accuracy, if we call back, we talked about forecasting. Number one, the forecast is always wrong. That's always the first rule of forecasting. But that being said, it's going to depend where you're at and where you're at in the supply chain. If you have a functional item, you're going to depend a lot about items being pushed through the whole system, and you're going to be relying upon your manufacturers, even your raw material the companies forecast as to what's going to be the primary thing. If you're going to be pulling it through, if you have an innovative company with an innovative product, you're going to be pulling it through to make certain that you have the customers being paid through that, that whole aspect of it. And you're going to be paying attention to the retailer's forecast, and that's going to be the primary one. So really, it's not necessarily the same forecast accuracy as we're finished goods in the process. So pay attention to the forecasting and know that there'll be a little bit different philosophy and goal in the process. So cost-based sourcing strategy, you want to really want to have a high component forecast accuracy for low supply risk. Think about the corners of our, of our four quadrants, low supply risk with high financial impact and slow is always appropriate. Have a lead time reduction strategy, trying to reduce the lead time in the process to get it faster to your client. Uh, so you have a low component forecast with accuracy and have a high financial of uh, risk with fast clock speed, that's always a big deal. And then have flexibility and lead time strategy where you have a low component forecast accuracy, okay, high financial risk, fast clock speed. All the iterations you have at each one of these is gonna play a role because we're thinking big picture here and what you should outsource and what you shouldn't. Make certain, no matter what decision you make, you're adding value to the buyers in the process. Who's ever buying, make certain that they're gonna see the value of your philosophy from your forecast all the way through your delivery method. And also, if you're gonna outsource, you're gonna be adding value. Identify savings opportunities. You saw what a 1% change in your procurement strategy really means to different companies. For those that already have a high profit rate, it's a big deal. If you're in the grocery business, really the profitability is so low. If you can pull off a 1% savings on revenue as to how you procure things, all of a sudden, boom, now you have a big impact. So it's going to depend on what industry that you're in. But regardless, no matter what, even if it's a even if it's a 1% savings on procurement and you're adding that 1% to the bottom line, your profitability, and you're in the grocery business, you are a hero and everybody will salute you in the process and you might even get paid the next week. So that being said, increase the number of suppliers involved in the bidding event always reduces your costs hopefully not your quality, and, and really making certain you're identifying and qualifying your supporting suppliers, sometimes conduct a bidding event. Only if you're big enough to sit down there and mandate that. If you're the little efficient upon, that may not be the best for you. So relatively small suppliers can expand their market horizon if they go out there, because sometimes even if you're a small fish out there, uh, there's other small fish too looking to be fed in the process. So make certain you uh, have an opportunity to access different spot markets. And look at, look at there's advantages in fragmented markets where the markets don't talk to each other, reducing market and sales costs, looking the uh, increasing the ability to compete on price. The more you do that, it's called capitalism. That really is what really drives really the, the reduction of costs and a lot of profitability in different things. So being said that, do the benefits compensate for reduction in revenue? Sometimes when you start lowering your costs, you're going to have that as well. It just depends where you're at in the process. So suppliers, suppliers, especially those with brand name recognition, which you, which is what you want to advertise for your own product, may be the selling your services through e-markets. I have to tell you, that's a concern for one area that we're looking at right now in the e-market world. So pay attention to what it is. Licensing fees, okay, uh, software vendor licenses, they make an awful lot of money if they could automate that sale in the workplace. Subscription fees are not the latest rage. They have been for about five years. Oh, get this over here. And so now we're into the uh, SAAS service, as, uh, basically. So, so the service as a sub subscription. So you're looking at a modification to the value proposition. It just depends where you're at. Four types of market out here, the e-markets, private e-markets, consortium e-markets, and content-based e-markets. This is much bigger than I've been aware of. And I'm really impressed by the aspect of how the world has shifted in the last 10 years. So that being said, it, look, look at the value proposition 
of, of, by offering additional services. It depends where you're at. Look at inventory management, supply chain planning, financial services, all these can add stuff. Shoot, I, I even have a credit card now for my airline. So I got the service of, of if flight, but also, oh, by the way, we have this good deal over here. You can have more miles if you do this. So, so all of a sudden now I'm being offered financial services by my airline. That's kind of incredible, but you're seeing everybody jumping into different bandwagons, different things. Walmart just recently bought a television company. They bought Vizio. So all of a sudden now Walmart is in the retail, they're in online, and now they're in the television business on top of that as well. A lot of people are crossing different aspects of it. Here, this is kind of a fun thing. Uh, go check out this website here. Uh, I think it's pifa.com PIFA services. It's a fresh fish market. You too can, can get into the bidding war to get your latest cod or or your or, or your uh, filet of whatever fish that you want over here in the price. It's kind of an interesting aspect of it. You'll see more of these e-markets out there. A lot of them are private for different segments of the market. And, and you'll see these reverse auction process as well as supplier negotiation going on. Subway, they got 16,000 members in over 70 countries, but they let their restaurants purchase from over 100 suppliers. One franchise I'm involved with, they try to lock you into only their one, and oh, by the way, they probably get a little commission on the side. So that being said, Motorola, they also have their own way of doing stuff. So Motorola allows the different vendors to have a supplier negotiation of software. You'll see that. There's a whole series. Here's four examples of different companies that within the same industry. You have Covicent, okay, is actually a place in the automotive industry where you go in and it's an e-market. You can buy different components. If you decide that you were in the aerospace industry, Exostar, Trade Ranger in the oil industry, You'll see the, the really the consortia-based e-markets where a group of companies will actually develop their own thing with different suppliers where you can sit down and purchase items online in the process. Two types of markets, maintenance, repair, and operations of goods, industry-specific products. You'll see a whole series out there, but you have to go hunting for them. Sometimes they're not always visible to the general public. But if you're in the industry, you'll probably know about them. So pay attention to them. You can get some good deals, not only on parts, but also on vendors. If you're looking for, you know, basically somebody that's a, a freelancer, you can pick somebody up in the designs. It, there's a lot of different things out there. So, so with that being said, supply chain benefits, forecasts always vary, lead time reduction strategy, flexibility, and having a good overall lead time strategy is a real positive thing for you as a, as a business. The supply chain e-commerce strategies, look on the aspect of how you get value added, look on the consortium-based, content-based e-markets that may help your business big picture-wise get an edge in the market. And you may pick up a supplier based on the e-market that you never heard of, that small wanting with something more and they're hungry, they want to sit down and, and grab as much market share at a low price and that may benefit you as well. So pay attention all the time to new opportunities because doors open and that means opportunities open as well for you to sit down there and help reduce your overall cost to your organization in the supply chain. Take care.